Good, welcome to the old classic car channel and today's brochure review is for the classic Triumph TR7 of the 1970s. Uh, the TR7 led a troubled life, um, introduced as it was bang in the middle of uh, the glory days of British Leyland, industrial strife, strikes, poor quality control and so on. And uh, there were various things counting against it from the beginning to be honest. Over its production run, which was from late 1974 to 1981, it was actually produced in three different sites. Uh, the early cars were built at Speak in Liverpool until 1978, and this is an example of one of them here on this uh, 1977 brochure. Then production moved to Canley, down at Coventry, which was the traditional home of Triumph cars for many years. And then in 1980 it moved again to Solihull, which can't have helped with production uh, quality and so on. Uh, the car itself, the fixed head only to begin with, was launched in the USA in January of 1975 and in the UK in May 1976, Harris Mann's wedgie two-seater two-door sports car for the 1970s. Uh, it received, I think it's fair to say, a mixed reception when it came along in 1974-75, uh, replacing as it did the, the big hairy chested TR6, um, whereas uh, the 6 had a straight six cylinder engine 2.5 liters quite a macho car soft top uh, big warbly exhaust note and so on the tr7 with its four cylinder two liter engine which was a slightly enlarged version of the dolomite 1850 um, was seen as a bit of a weedy replacement to be honest uh, i remember even back in the day they weren't lauded for being particularly great cars but i think as 1970s cars go few cars look as correct for the era as the TR7, the wedgie TR7. I think, even though I'm not big on 70s cars, I just think these are quite a great looking car for the era. And I can see why they came out with it. It's just a shame that they weren't produced slightly better. Like I say, this is a 1977 brochure, so this will be a speak-built car. And one of the key differentiators when you're looking at a TR7 is the bonnet. The bonnet on the Canley and Solihull built cars typically had an extra hump, a second hump on the bonnet, a bulge. Uh, whereas the speak built cars typically were flatter, such as the example shown here. So let's have a look at this particular brochure. I got this myself back in 1977-78 as a whippersnapper from Reed and Sons, which was the uh, local BL garage on High Street, Cheadle in Cheshire, and I've had it ever since. So uh, while there's a few marks and signs of age on the brochure, um, it's pretty much the same story for myself as well. So let's have a quick look inside and see how the TR7 was marketed in this brave world of the 1970s. Some years ago we decided it was time for a new sports model to continue the successful TR line. Whatever we designed had to conform very strictly to existing and future legislation on safety and pollution. It would also have to be economical on petrol. So already they're sort of laying out the ground rules for how the TR7 came into being and these are obviously early drawings of how they intended the car to look uh, probably penned by Harris Mann, the man responsible for most of the styling on the car I believe and just as important it would have to be something neglected in sports cars for years comfortable again trying to differentiate it from the TR6 which went before I imagine the requirements were formidable but for our designers readily accepted the challenge. The early sketches were fascinating. It was obvious from the beginning that this was going to be an exceptional car. Undoubtedly, the trial styling was strikingly dramatic and highly individual, and all the safety requirements had been designed into it. Its shape was totally out of the TR idiom. It had the look of a car of tomorrow. It was a purposeful wedge shape. The bonnet was low and sweeping, and the tail was high and cut off. Stylish and purposeful. Now, what about an engine to match its sleekness? It was decided that the engine was to be a 2 litre version of the Triumph Dolomite engine, an engine already famous for its power output at such a light weight. All that remained now was to put our new brainchild to the test. The engine, particularly, was rigorously tested. Prototypes were secretly shipped out of England, bound for Canada and America for all weather testing, and they were given a harsh introduction to the road. They survived the ordeal with flying colours. Undoubtedly, from the tip of its high back to the front bumper, the car was going to be a champion. And so, the TR7 was born. Let's keep going here. So initially, only a fixed head version was available, which rankled some of the enthusiasts back in the day, because previously TRs had always been available as convertibles. But thanks to sort of safety legislation, primarily in the USA, 
the first TR7s up until what about 1979 I think it was um, they were all the fixed head coupes with the optional Webasto roof just to sort of offset the fact that you couldn't buy an open topped example or version so here we have a nice cutaway drawing showing the the Dolomite based engine sat at the front, traditional rear wheel drive, like I said the wedgie styling, uh, distinctive checked seats and so on, all very 1970s and like I say, uh, if you were going to pick a car, a British car of the 1970s that represented that era, the era of styling, the design cues that were becoming popular at the time, this could really not be beaten, uh, it couldn't be from any other decade than the 1970s. So let's have a quick look here car designed on the basis of major motoring needs for the next 20 years its interior comfort is comparable to a luxury saloon car and its design meets all and more of the safety requirements we lay down for it it has a top speed of well over 100 miles per hour and there's extra cost options to the four speed gearbox a five speed synchromesh gearbox the price also includes 185 hr13 tires and medium duty rear axle an automatic transmission are also available uh, the, cro the roof is crush resistant with front and rear impact, rollover and side intrusion resistance. In tests, pressures of up to £25,000 were applied to different parts of the body before final approval. The bonnet is designed to resist backwards movement under impact. The doors have reinforced hinges and anti-side intrusion barriers built in. And the interior story is just as fascinating. The TR7 is unashamedly a two-seater. We decided to do away with useless small seats in the back so you could have maximum room in the front and the page folds out and here we have a superb picture of an all white TR7 fixed head in some glamorous location somewhere and over here a TR7 speeding along on a dusty road and other various glamour locations selling the lifestyle of the typical TR7 owner not for him or her, sat in traffic jams on the M6 on a rainy Friday afternoon. No, this was the, this was the world that the TR7 owner could look forward to. And if you think of what else would BL were producing at the time, the MGB, I mean that was drawing its pension by the 1970s, same for the Triumph Spitfire and the MG Midget. So the TR7 was a real departure for BL and it was a real attempt to produce a modern sports car, two-seater affordable sports car for the 1970s. Uh, that's a couple of, on a couple of occasions they did even look of doing an MG version of the TR7 but that didn't come to anything. Um, but on paper it should have been a very successful car I think. I think they made about 115,000 in all including the later convertibles and the, the handful of TR8s that were produced and the TR7 Sprint homologation specials. Um, which I think around 60 of those were built with a Dolly Sprint engine, a 16 valve engine, which would have really transformed the car if they'd put that into mass production and got on top of the reliability problems of the Dolly Sprint engine. I think that would have been a real winner. It's just a shame they couldn't. Perhaps they didn't have the funds to do all that, I'm not really sure. Um, but it's a shame that for what was a promising design, I think, it didn't see better success than it did. So, over here... We have a little more detail of the specification. Windscreen washers and wipers, direction indicators, headlamp, dip and horn are under your fingertips on the steering column stalk. And for fresh air enthusiasts, a folding fabric sunroof with wind deflector for draft free motoring is available at extra cost. The compact four speed gearbox has synchromesh on all forward speeds and features a selector rail designed for smoother and more precise gear changing. And since the car is capable of high speeds, the brakes are designed accordingly with discs front and drums rear combination incorporating direct acting servo with a tandem master cylinder. One of the major areas where the TR7 scores over its competitors in its ride and handling. By combining carefully chosen spring rates and long but controlled suspension travel, we've managed to give the kind of ride you expect only from a luxury saloon car. And so we go on. There's the gloriously 70s interior, which reminds me very much of uh, a GTM 
kit car that my uncle had in the 1970s and again the backrest of the seat was directly against the rear bulkhead but in that case it was rear engined um, but yes you've got this wonderfully tartan interior and door panels a uh, little light set in there look like a bit of an afterthought to be honest and a very plasticky dashboard and steering wheel uh, so far removed from the TR6 interior that came before bang up to date probably but did it look nice not so sure let's have a quick look over here and <laughs> these are your typical TR7 buyers I'm not quite sure he perhaps is and she probably is I'm not sure about this chap here unless he's the salesman perhaps selling it uh, again more information of the suspension and running gear it's air blending system one of the most flexible systems you can have in a car whatever amount of warmth you want you can get it all in all there are six vents in the car to provide you with every conceivable condition of air impressed only one thing will impress you more a test drive so why not arrange one soon it'll be an experience you won't forget until you own one we fold this page over and we have the driver's eye view of that sea of plastic uh, I think whereas the exterior styling was quite up to date quite daring if you like almost for the era a bit like the Fiat X19 in many respects the interior it's efficient I'm not quite sure how well these ancillary gauges could be viewed these are fairly clear but I mean that steering wheel dear oh dear but it was the 1970s um, but you know was the fit and finish really up to snuff um, perhaps owners of a TR7 I mean I, I hold my hand up I've never owned a TR7 so if TR7 owners are watching this and could comment in the section below um, I'd be interested to hear exactly what a TR7 is like to own were they poorly screwed together um, was it very much a case of if you had a Friday afternoon car you were going to be in a lot of trouble or were they and are they unfairly maligned and seen as a poor cousin of the TR line if you like I very much welcome your thoughts on that and if we carry on over here we have an automatic version with red checked interior uh, for added glamour and excitement a sea of moulded plastic as always uh, but that was pretty typical for the era so we mustn't be too harsh I'm not quite sure what he represents to be honest but Let's carry on regardless. Like I say, compared to the MGB, the Spitfire and the Midget, this was cutting edge stuff for an affordable British two seat sports car. And here we've got a young dashing couple looking happy and jolly in a, an exotic location somewhere, cold, uh, somewhere very warm and arid. And again, over here, so, got some horsey types here in the diving etc so it's all very glamorous a world away from speak in Liverpool which is where this era of car was produced and again glamorous locations for a glamorous car a TR7 and here we have the engine specification like I say the engine was a four-cylinder slightly enlarged version of the Dolomite 1850 unit and maximum power 105 brake horsepower at five and a half thousand revs per minute Maximum torque 119 pound foot at three and a half thousand revs per minute. Twin SCU HS6 carburetors and a mechanical fuel pump and a 12 gallon fuel tank. Uh, we've got various details of the coachwork two door, two seater, closed top sports car. Steel panelled body of unitary construction with separate front subframe and forward hinge bonnet. Tinted laminated glass windscreen, toughened safety glass quarter lights and winding side windows. Again, all the details are here, so we'll have a closer look at that in a moment. Uh, this is a UK market car, obviously. And let's carry on over here. And there is the mighty power plant. Four cylinders, twin carburetors, forward mounted rear wheel drive, etc. And the Lucas battery there. The dimensions are here. Like I say, about 115,000 were built in all, and this was the final Triumph sports car. Uh, later, it was the Triumph Acclaim that came along, uh, which was really a Triumph in badge only, to be honest. It was largely a Honda built here. Uh, and the TR7 continued in production until October 1981, uh, by which time you could buy the fixed head or the drop head coupe version. 
there was the TR8 with the three and a half liter Rover engine. Uh, most of those went to the USA. Uh, and like I say before, there's the TR7 Sprint, which around 60 of were built with the Dolomite Sprint 16 valve engine. That was primarily just to get the car and the cylinder head homologated for the British Leyland Rally program that was running throughout the 1970s. Uh, they did dabble with a 2 plus 2 fastback, uh, the Lynx, uh, which survives down at the British Motor Museum at Gaydon. And like I said before, MG versions were looked at on a couple of occasions, but didn't come to anything. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a shame that the TR7 wasn't more successful. I don't think 115,000 over a fairly lengthy production run of what six, seven years, about well, seven years, um, was all that great. Um, like I say, in the comments section, please let me know what you think of TR7s. Are they unfairly maligned, or are they the poor relation in the TR line for a reason? Uh, is that an unfair criticism? I don't know. Uh, I'd love to hear from people who actually have TR7s themselves, like them, restore them, etc. and so on. So I hope this video was of interest. Um, like I said, this brochure I retrieved from a BL garage back in the day and it's been with me ever since. Uh, there will be more videos coming along shortly. Uh, if you've got any requests for cars of this era, brochure reviews for particular cars that you're fond of, please let me know. And uh, yeah, also check out the channel because there's uh, videos being updated and uploaded uh, on a weekly basis now. So I hope that was of interest and uh, thanks for watching.